this week. Truth or untruth? Deception or stagecraft? We opine, we decide. We're going deep this week on the purposeful blurring of reality and fiction in audio drama, right here on Radio Drama Revival. Hey folks, welcome to Radio Drama Revival, the podcast that showcases the diversity and vitality of modern audio fiction. I'm your host, David Reinstrom. We're in a curious, cynical age. Anyone who considers themselves media literate, and I assume that's most of us here, has become rather skeptical in the last handful of years about hoaxes. It's surprisingly easy to get roped in by your own confirmation bias, and before long you've fallen headlong into conspiracy and outright falsehoods. This means that in order to figure out what is real and what's not in news media, we've needed to develop a healthy skepticism, whether that be for thinly sourced stories or news articles from papers that don't actually exist. But this trend extends not only to journalism, but to audio fiction that purports to be journalism. So, joining me now to talk about audio fiction that deliberately blurs the lines between the real and the unreal is Will Williams, the critic behind the popular blog Podcast Problems. How do you do, Will? I do so well. How do you do, David? I do splendidly. Good. Where would you like to begin? Well, you know, I think the place I want to begin is just a brief discussion of actually a Radio Lab episode I heard all the way back in 2013. This episode discussed War of the Worlds. And, you know, I had heard about War of the Worlds growing up. We studied it one year when I was in elementary school for Halloween. We listened to the whole thing which really probably (laughs) was an influence on why I love radio so much now and audio so much now. One of the amazing things about the episode, though, is that it talked about how we kind of perceive War of the Worlds as a thing that happened once, and we look back on it like, oh, these silly people in the 30s, they believed this thing was real. And Radiolab debunks that because it's happened several times, and each time this broadcast is done, people buy into it. There was One instance in Quito in Ecuador in 1949. There was one in Chile in 1944. And then one in Buffalo, New York in 1968. 68. And people still bought it. And when I thought about this episode, I couldn't help but think about 2017's The Polybius Conspiracy from Radiotopia's Showcase. So let's catch people up in case people haven't heard that show. What is that? What is that podcast about? So the Polybius Conspiracy is a seven-part miniseries from Showcase by Radiotopia. This is on a channel where Radiotopia tries to put podcasts that couldn't be, you know, full-blown ongoing shows. They're just little self-contained stories to try to highlight them, market them with the Radiotopia name, which I think is incredible. I think it's a great tactic. I remember hearing about Polybius from my partner, Jillian, and she was like, oh, you should listen to this thing. I think you'll like it. It's a documentary, I think is how she initially put it. And then later she said, after listening to it more, she's like, no, never mind. It's still good, but it's definitely not real. Yes, I think that that summarizes how we all experienced this. So the Polybius Conspiracy was sort of pitched as a documentary about this video game that was in the 1980s, allegedly, where it would show up in arcades in Portland in a completely black cabinet. And when people would play this game, it would hurt them. They would have psychological effects or they would have seizures and people would come in and take the box out, like the cabinet out. They would, you know, do tests on it. So the entire podcast was pitched as a documentary about that conspiracy. And I guess we should point out that muddying all of this is that it is like kind of a, in as much as a conspiracy can be real, the Polybius conspiracy is a, an idea that predates this podcast. Yes. Um, And leading up to it, several pieces recently have featured the Polybius conspiracy. There was, I believe, from Kotaku earlier this year, or I'm sorry, earlier in 2017, there was a feature about the Polybius conspiracy about, you know, several scary things and games that became kind of internet famous. And the Polybius conspiracy is, I think, what a lot of people would consider an early version of a creepypasta, <laughs> the kind of viral, scary stories you'll hear about on the internet. After the Polybius conspiracy was released, 
it was revealed that it is in fact what Julie Shapiro of Radiotopia calls a blend of fact and fiction. However, this was not explained until after the podcast had been released in full. So what does that what does that mean? So is the Polybius conspiracy there are, there are parts of it that strain credulity, right? There are there are bits that you know, now that I have that frame around it, I can be like, ah, that's made up, you know. But there are other parts that seem as though they are pulled from legitimate reporting on the issue and real interviews with real people. Yes. And even still, that line kind of hasn't been cleared up. So I know that early on, the producers of the show were attempting to make a film documentary about the Polybius conspiracy. Due to some issues, it seems like maybe funding, seems like maybe time. In their words, it seems like they just fell in love with podcasting. They converted to podcast, and that's when I think the fiction started coming in, and they started thinking, we can make a narrative out of this. So there are certain interviews. Um, for instance, there's, oh, the arcade that they go to. Um, ground Control? Is it Ground Control? Ground Control, thank you. So... Interviews with the ground control people, I believe, are genuine until they start discussing this sort of Byronic hero, <laughs> this sort of protagonist-antagonist of Bobby, who is the central character of what is more or less kind of an audio drama, kind of not. So, Will, lead me through the ethical ramifications of this. Why is this more of a coulda rather than a shoulda, like a thing that you, that can be done, but like, why is it maybe, in your view, not a responsible thing to do? First and foremost, my main issue with it is after the news was revealed officially, yes, this is a blend of fact and fiction, there was a frowning upon of the listener. It was the listener's fault that they didn't understand this. It was the listener's fault that they bought into it. And there was a kind of unkind view of the listener as being naive or being kind of stupid, honestly. And I understand that, absolutely. Looking back on it now, there are certain parts where very clearly, you know, it was scripted. Even while I was listening, I continually asked, I googled every single episode, is the Polybius conspiracy real? Because I didn't buy it but everything around its branding suggested that it was. So first off, I think that we should discuss that the podcast kind of gaslights the audience and then shames them for being gaslighted. Should we gloss the term gaslighting? Yes, absolutely. Gaslighting is when you take someone's knowledge and say, oh, no, 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 that's false. It didn't happen this way. You're misreading it to sort of dismiss their interpretation of something. This is something that's very commonly used in abusive situations. And I think that more and more discussions of it are happening in regards to the news or reporting or essentially just the national conversations happening right now. I think, and I, I could be wrong, but uh, the, the term, I know that it comes from a film called Gaslight, yes. which is, I'm pretty sure, about a man that conspires to drive his wife mad by playing with the gas lamp in their home and making the lights flicker and making weird stuff happen. And then she comes to him and talks about it and says, like, hey, there's something up with the lights. And then he repeatedly denies her lived experience and says, no, there's something wrong with your vision or you're hallucinating. Yes, absolutely. Even though he is himself engineering the flickering. Exactly. Um, and I think that it's pretty clear to see the parallels here. Listeners have been told, oh, you're overreacting. Oh, this is your fault that you didn't understand. When in reality, the listener was given no tools. In the context of the current podcasting atmosphere, I think that it's, you know, even a little bit more heightened. We can see that this structure has been used previously in shows like S-Town or um, Serial, obviously, where there's this larger than life story and it seems too interesting to be real but again, you know, we're being told this is true. This is an actual thing that's happened. And in the case of those two shows, that's true. In the case of this show, it's only partially true. But the listener is expected to simultaneously believe that it is true and believe that it's not true. And then the listener is not rewarded for half of what it's being led to do. Right. Fellow podcaster and cartoonist 
Uh, Ryan Estrada calls this kayfabe. He uses the wrestling term kayfabe. Are you familiar with that term? I'm not. So kayfabe is the mass delusion that a performer puts up in the world of wrestling. So we talk about professional wrestling and we say, oh, professional wrestling's not real. But if you went up and you asked, you know, The Rock when The Rock was wrestling, like, hey, is this real? He would have to say, of course. It's kind of a Carney's code to not give the game away, to not break the the fourth wall, to wink at the audience. You have to maintain the illusion. It's cast members at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. It's cast members at Disneyland. Like, there's not a human inside that suit. That's goofy. Because if if you pull off the head and there's just a man who lives in Celebration, Florida inside that suit, it kind of wrecks some part of the magic for some people. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that there's a time and a place for kayfabe. And, and, and while prepping for this episode, one of the shows that you suggested I listen to was Limetown. So I did my Limetown re-listen, which if you haven't listened to it, uh, you absolutely should. Gentle listener. It's Highly recommended. Very good. Similar structure in many ways to Serial. It's about a woman who's doing uh, a podcast investigation. The episodes come out in real time and change the texture of the investigation as it goes on. Like as as she uncovers things publicly, more people come forward, inspired by the podcast. And I don't know when this changed or if it did change, but when I, I went to the website and I saw now that they put up credits for every single episode. And it's not – it's it's avoidable. Mm -hmm. uh, you can click on the button that says credits and it brings up like a little JavaScript module and it has – you know, the the episode writer's credits and it has the actors and the sound designers and it acknowledges that it is a constructed narrative. Yeah. Does that fix everything, Will? I think it fixes quite a lot. Personally, I would have liked to been able to Google, is the Polybius conspiracy real and gotten a simple yes or no? And I listened to Limetown as it was coming out. I don't remember the credits. There's a good chance I just didn't see them. But I do remember Googling, is Limetown real and getting a definitive no? I think perhaps a bit more transparency than just credits or just being able to Google could be beneficial. I do think that the level of immersion that Limetown offers, where you could just live within that fiction and accept it, would lead to the kind of narrative that Polybius is looking to accomplish. Because at its core, the Polybius conspiracy is a narrative about the objective truth. It is about finding fact. It is about uh, voyeuristic journalism. It is about wanting to find a protagonist where there might not be one. I think that a level of immersion needs to occur there, and I think that what Limetown did, where it gives you the option of finding the facts, I think that that really gets rid of most of the problems that I have with the Polybius conspiracy. I want to dig in uh, with you as to why this seems to be a trend in podcasting, because something I've been noticing for the last call it half decade of this medium in productions mostly out of the United States and Canada is that the text has this habit of acknowledging the frame. There has to be some explicit reason why the audio for the podcast exists. So whether that show is itself a podcast like Limetown or The Black Tapes or Welcome to Night Vale or if it's like found footage or voice memos, and that, that's the sort of thing that covers everything from The Bright Sessions to 36 Questions to Ars Paradoxica. All of it's acknowledging the presence of a microphone. And podcast fiction from the UK and the Republic of Ireland and from Germany and South Africa seems to acknowledge the frame significantly less often. It doesn't say, this is why there's a microphone in this scene. It just is. Like, in TV, no one ever bothers to ask why... There's a TV camera that captures the action in Fraser Crane's living room. Do you have any hypotheses around why? First of all, do you, do you accept the frame of that question? I do. This is actually the first post I ever wrote for Podcast Problems. Uh, it's called Misusing the Medium. And Podcast Problems is named after a set of specific posts called Podcast Problems. These are trends I see in podcasts that frustrate me. Misusing the Medium was about how so many podcasts, so many audio dramas, I should be specific, seem to desire or think that they have to fit into this framing device, when really, just like you said, 
TV shows do not have to justify being TV shows. If they do, they're, they're doing something transformative with the medium. Take, for instance, Community. It's showing that it's aware that it's a TV show, but it's doing something within that medium that justifies that framework. I would put the same as, for instance, within The Wires. It's acknowledging that it is, in its first season, relaxation tapes, but it's doing something very strange and subversive within that medium. So yes, I absolutely agree that that's a trend, and it is one that drives me a little crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But I think, as you just said, it's not necessarily a problem to acknowledge the frame. No. That's That's not what we're saying at all. We're trying to be doctrinaire about how people should tell stories. Not at all. But it it does seem to me and to you that the great majority of of, of American podcasts and and some Canadian podcasts as well as though I can think of others that don't do this are constantly acknowledging the frame. And I wonder if it is because I mean there are I, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think the United States has spent many decades away from audio fiction mm-hmm. in a way that there is a continuous line in the UK. To a lesser extent in Canada, the CBC stopped uh, commissioning audio dramas a, a while back, but more recently than than the US did. And I also wonder if it's because of the influence of specifically Serial and Welcome to Night Vale. I've had conversations with people where they say, oh, podcasts, yeah, I love true crime. <laughs> uh, where true crime, like... That's what podcasts are, where you say, oh, here are the most pertinent examples of that form, and that kind of, to them, dictates what that form, therefore, must be. Absolutely. I think that Serial, when it first came out, it was discussed as something that would change the medium, and I think that we've seen the very real effects of that. Serial, because it was so immersive, it was so pertinent at the time, you know, it discussed a lot of, I think, what was in the national conversation— And because it was so genuinely riveting and well-made, I think that a lot of other shows want to replicate that idea instead of trying to do something that has the same energy, but a different perspective or a different frame. I think that we've seen works that are just as immersive, just as interesting, without needing that frame of investigative journalism. And one of the trends I saw in 2017 that I'm really excited about is audio dramas that are completely moving away from that structure. We can look at things like Greater Boston. We can look at things like What's the Frequency? And I think it seems to be freeing the idea that we don't have to rely on this framing device. You don't have to consider why your story would exist in the medium. You can just embrace the medium. And I think that that gives storytellers a lot more freedom to work within. Yeah, you can even see the Bright Sessions moving away from this model. They've been steadily moving away from recorded sessions or even coming up with rationales for why you can hear discussions. Yes, and I love that. I mean, especially as things get strange and subjective and like traveling with Sam, for example, as she time travels, you know, there would be no real good in-universe justification for that. But it's narratively important for us to encounter it. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to loop back to something that you touched on with the discussion of American media spending some time away from audio drama and radio plays and the like. I think that this is one of the biggest factors of why the Polybius conspiracy bothers me so much. Other than just the the gaslighting and the lack of transparency, audio drama is not treated very well by traditional media. (laughs) Um, I think, you know, more and more we've had that discussion publicly about the fact that we have all of these top 10 lists with no fiction, or if it is fiction, maybe just Welcome to Night Vale, maybe just Homecoming thrown in. What bothers me is that Radiotopia is an incredible network. They do amazing shows, but they haven't really dipped into audio drama yet. They do have the truth. They do, yes. It's flash fiction, though, and I would say that that's substantially different than a serialized audio drama. Okay. It's frustrating that we could have had something that appealed to a massive audience because the Polybius Conspiracy got a lot of discussion. And had it been marketed as an audio drama, that would have been more respect for audio drama as a medium in my eyes. Um, But because of the marketing, we didn't quite get that. Sure. I would like to push back on on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't do this kind of prep 
for today. I, I should have looked up what Julie Shapiro said if she had anything to say about Song of Knots, which was a serialized audio drama made by the truth. You're completely right. Thank you. That slipped my memory. But I do, I do agree with you that uh, I, I think that fiction podcasts do get short shrift. Anyway, but help me bridge this to fake news somehow. Not for just the cheap sake of being topical, but just because I think it's relevant, right? I started reading this Wired article this morning, and then I had to put it down because I was going to work, about Facebook's response to the featured news segment. What do they call that little that little box in the corner? How they fired all their journalists and turned it over to the algorithm, and then shortly thereafter, the things that those journalists had been suppressing because they were bullshit started bubbling up into people's news feeds. Mm -hmm. And I think I've seen this sentiment written all over the internet, but some oh, I think this was by a former Funny or Die writer uh, who said that something that Facebook does as a – and I, I think this can be expanded out to the internet broadly, but something that Facebook does specifically as a publishing platform is that it flattens and decontextualizes all information such that like – some BS article written by a couple of Macedonian teenagers for like ad revenue about how the Pope endorsed Donald Trump, which didn't happen, you know, has the same kind of weight and heft to it as does some extraordinarily well-researched, you know, we spoke to 20 witnesses piece from the Washington Post or the New York Times and kind of removes in some ways people's ability to – evaluate as effectively as they could whether or not the thing that they're looking at is true. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we talk about people getting suckered in by fake news and we say like, oh, those people are dummies. But I think it's the same kind of gaslighting enabled by a platform. Absolutely. As being made to think that a mockumentary is a documentary. Absolutely. And this goes back further to the question of ethics when it comes to the Polybius conspiracy. Is it ethical to frame something that's fiction as nonfiction. I think that more and more, it's harder to distinguish between those lines, um, whether it's because of algorithms spitting out the exact same, that flattened idea of this is the same as this, regardless of the actual content. We can look at, for instance, going back to War of the Worlds and look at the context in which it was released. Each time it was released, it was a post-war or mid-war society it was framed in the same grammar, we can say, as the actual radio broadcasts of the time. Each iteration of it was updated to sound more like modern radio. And so it seemed likely and easy to buy into because it was done exactly in the way of radio. In fact, at one point in War of the Worlds, just after the sort of attack scene about 12 minutes in, the interviewer has to train the interviewee how to use the mics. He says, louder, please, <laughs> louder, just to try to make it sound more authentic. Right. The Polybius conspiracy does all of the same things. Um, we have people who are bad at mics. We have immersive sound design. So with this culture of fake news, whether it be genuinely fake news or what politicians are writing off as fake news, the lines are becoming blurry. And adding to that culture does not seem like an incredibly empathetic or kind thing to do in such a climate, especially not if the blame is going to be put on the audience. Now, I will say if if War of the Worlds were released as a podcast, on the, for example, on the All Things Considered NPR newsfeed podcast, I don't think it would have had the same impact that it had in, what, 1938? Because you can't Tune in to the middle of a podcast. <gasps> wait, wait, you can. Okay, so here's the thing <laughs> about the original CBS broadcast, right, is that three times during the production it said, like, this is a production of the Mercury Theater on the air. What you're about to hear is a work of fiction. Here's a note from Orson Welles. Mm -hmm. Will. Yes. You know how some people really don't like pre-roll ads? Yes, I do. And set their favorite podcasts to begin like 45 seconds or 60 seconds in? Yes, David, I do. So it could conceivably happen that someone was listening to, so let's say NPR puts out an All Things Considered episode. Because they did, for, for the, I think it was the 75th anniversary um, 
David Osman, I think it was David Osman of the Firesign Theater did a revamped War of the Worlds and it cuts in on like a a broadcast with like Terry Gross doing Fresh Air uh, and Terry Gross has to like respond to, Mm -hmm. have you heard this? I have, yes. <laughs> doesn't doesn't she like have to comment on like the aliens like landing in Grover's Mill, New Jersey? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, never mind. People could fall for it. Also, people did fall for it. Sure. The Polybius conspiracy. Right, right. We have an exact. We have an exact analog. It's an exact, almost one to one. Yes. But if it did come with a disclaimer, right, or or some FAQ that said like, hey, you know, you came searching to find whether or not this was a real thing. Pranks over. It's not. Exactly. That would have solved the issue. That would address it. Right. Okay. Um, another example of that is Christopher Reynaga's fantastic Point Mystic is this beautifully immersive, largely improvised show, which was recently featured on Radio Drama Revival. I was very happy as a fan. So it was. <laughs> but on their site, it says, you know, what is Point Mystic? And it says Point Mystic is a radio broadcast and it's set here. And it Let's the listener assume, oh, it's real, but then it has further links and you get down to essentially, what is Point Mystic really? And it says, this is a work of fiction. It was done by these people. It was largely improvised. It is a work of fiction. Just give your listeners the tools. Here's here's something that I really appreciate about that uh, and something that I appreciate about Limetown putting their credits up is the people that are in that are creative contributors to that work yes and i want to know if i really loved a performance in a piece of fiction maybe i want to seek out that person's other work and if they're not credited like i don't know who plays bobby feldman i kind of thought it was brian posein for a little bit i don't know who plays ruben right and both of those performances both bobby and ruben were fantastic performances that's largely why we bought into it because they were incredible sure who are these people i want their work i want all of it (laughs) is it worth it to deny a credit just for the sake of maintaining kayfabe that's that's the question that i think people have to weigh as creatives and i think the answer is it's not worth it I don't think so at all. Granted, these people could still put, you know, this credit on a resume or what have you, but that's not going to build up a listenership of any sort. I think my problem with the Polybius conspiracy is that, well, if you can view it as an audio drama and you can go in with that understanding, it's really a gorgeous work. I think that it accomplishes a lot very, very well, but everything about it seems deeply rooted in a sense of unkindness. And I don't know if we should be making the space for that or applauding that within the space. The podcast community is really, really lovely. It's a community that is built on empathy. It's a community built on wanting each other to succeed and being inclusive and trying to make things in a way that is empathy forward. And I feel like this completely lacks that. Again, I feel like it's a good work. I just feel like I maybe don't have the energy to spend on something that is rooted in a lack of empathy. Sure. Or that thinks you're dumb. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that too. <laughs> As I was re-listening to War of the Worlds, uh, something occurred to me that I, I, I now perceive to be a kind of vile stroke of genius when after the initial uh, clash between the New Jersey state militia and the alien war machine, Mm -hmm. uh, the Battle of Grover's Mill, they go to Washington and they get a statement, not from the president or the vice president or anyone that like the vast majority of people would have been able to identify in 1938, but the secretary of the interior. (laughs) Like nobody knows who the secretary of the interior is. So if you're trying to rook a, a significant group of people, uh, into accepting this verisimilitude uh, and be like, ah, yes, this is real. Even if you did know who the Secretary of the Interior is, I don't think they say his name. If you said, here's a message from the Secretary of the Interior now, and you just had some deep-voiced man with, like, a Western accent, and he claimed to be Ryan Zinke? Like, look, I'm a politics nerd, but I don't know what, like, Ryan Zinke's actual voice sounds like. And I thought that was just very clever because they thought to avoid including anyone's voices that would be recognizable. 
Absolutely. And they pull on these other sort of experts. For instance, early on, they have a Dr. Gray from the Natural History Museum who is there to debunk any sort of uh, thoughts on something being maybe alien. He comes in and he says, it's just a meteor. Calm down. I have a doctoral degree. I know what I'm talking about. And it sounds legitimate. It sounds very professional. He sounds completely uh, exhausted by this concept. That's Wells, right? Isn't that Wells is the astrophysicist? I believe so, yes. And it's just having that step to initially dismiss the concept and have this, you know, alleged expert, I think, adds to that as well, which is also a large framing of the Polybius conspiracy. To have someone there saying like, oh, no, 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 it's 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 BS. Exactly. And with that, there's also this concept of Bobby as the protagonist, if you will. He's also perhaps seen as an antagonist. But he's introduced to the listener as a sort of protagonist. And Bobby's entire arc revolves around this concept of wanting to be believed and wanting to be understood. Basic narrative rules tell the listener that they should trust Bobby, even if they don't necessarily want to, even if they question him several times. The urge Mm -hmm. here is that Bobby is the protagonist His arc is to be believed. And as the listener, if this is a show that you're going to stick with, you have to have a little bit of buy-in to want to believe Bobby. Right. Which then leads you down this rabbit hole. You know, is it fake? Is it real? Do I believe Bobby? Do I not? And again, that all goes back to that central core theme of the objective truth and trying to find it. But the real person who is looked down upon for it is, again, it just keeps coming back to the listener. It doesn't end with us saying, oh, Bobby is the antagonist or, oh, the producers are the antagonist. It comes back to the listener is the antagonist. I don't know what good that necessarily accomplishes. And I certainly don't know what good that accomplishes when we've already had spoofs of Serial or other takes on Serial like Limetown. Mm -hmm. The same could be said for the recent piece by The Onion, A Very Fatal Murder and American Vandal. Though that's a completely different conversation. Sure, that's a that's a very different conversation. <laughs> I'm so frustrated with podcasts doing that thing. What, blaming the viewer for the events? Yes, yes. I think what it is, is I'm very tired of podcasts that hate podcasts. <laughs> sure. I'm so sick of it, and I'm so sick of podcasts that just hate their listener, that just think that their listener is doing something inherently bad by being a podcast listener who wants to believe in a podcast. I I will say in defense of A Very Fatal Murder that since the whole thing amounts to about 45 minutes, I don't, I don't feel the hate for that long. Fair. And it was also all released at once. Right. With the Polybius conspiracy, listeners were drawn out in the story. It was weekly and it was seven weeks. It was mm-hmm. a massive story. That's a long time to have your chain yanked. Mm-hmm. So, Will, let's pull back. What what principles do you think can be pulled out of this morass, as it were? Do you mean in as much as things that other podcasts should be doing? Yeah. What are things that other podcasts should be doing? Who are some people that are doing it right? What are some examples to emulate in this regard? First and foremost, I think I can say that you don't need to emulate something like Serial in order to tell a great story. There are plenty of other devices and and frames out there for you to work with. But should you follow in those footsteps, go investigative journalism, which has produced some really phenomenal work, you need to be transparent. I think that you can accomplish that with a level of immersion, kind of like how we've discussed with Limetown. I would say that The Black Tapes also does this well. Do they? Well... I don't know who's in The Black Tapes. God, that's true, but at least they say, hey, we're fiction. (laughs) Okay. But no, it is actually very, very hard to find their cast. I would say The Magical History of Knox County, which is clearly, it's clearly fake. It's, It's a magical realism, but it's delightful. And it's very straightforward about being fiction. So I would say, you know, also if you're very high concept, if you're very clearly removed from an actual, you know, real world society, you can go that route too. Transparency is key. And I don't think that you need to lose your immersion by offering transparency. You can offer transparency as a choice for your listener. You can embed it in your website. You can embed it at the very, very end of your credits. You can 
put something in just your social media. In the age of Google, your listener should be able to Google, is blank real? And find an answer. (laughs) It should not be difficult to Google whether your show is real and find an answer. I think that you can also do this in creative ways. Maybe something that you could do is reference a piece of media that is clearly not real. You could, for instance, um, I don't know if you listened to the Spirits episode of Greater Boston. Mm -hmm. So Spirits is a nonfiction show. It's a conversational piece between Amanda McLaughlin and Julia Shafini talking about mythology. They do a guest episode on Greater Boston. So if you listen to Greater Boston... Clearly, it's not real. Clearly, this is a nonfiction set in fiction, which is just delightful. Uh, But if you were just a Spirits fan listening to it, it's clearly not real because it's talking about a fictionalized Boston in which the red line is its own city. I think if you have facts that are clearly antithetical to the real world, that establishes it enough for you. You don't have to perhaps explicitly state that it's fiction, though I think that that's a very careful line you have to tow. Julia and Amanda also made an appearance on the science fiction podcast Our Fair City, yes. uh, doing a special episode called The Spookies, in which they played <laughs> paranormal mole people podcasters. I love them so much. <laughs> it was very cute. So I think that there are ways that you can you can work with in fiction, be clear about it, but not beat your audience over the head. I'm not asking any podcast to say, hey, by the way, psst, hey, Hey, we're fiction. Hey, we're an audio drama. I think that you can just be transparent in ways that are subtle and elegant and optional to the listener, but still existent. Sure. So so treat your listener like they are smart. Yeah. Basically. Mm-hmm. Cool. That seems simple enough and actionable. I really think it does. I really think it does. Um, I would say that if you don't think that your listeners are smart, there's a good chance that you're not making something smart for them. Or nice. <laughs> or nice. Yeah, if you if you hate your listener, I'm not sure why you're creating content, but you know. Oh man, you could expand that out to anything. Uh-huh. <laughs> like if you're if you're if you're writing a newspaper article and you're like, time to shit out another draft for these proles. Like, what are you doing in journalism? Why are you why are you in this thing that you hate so much? Yeah. Please make other life choices. Though, okay, I should say. It can't be for the money, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I will say, I don't think that that's the case with the Polybius conspiracy. I really... No, no. I do, at the end of the day, I think that the intentions here were solid. I think that it was really set out to make an interesting sort of meta narrative about truth, about journalism. And I think that to an extent it accomplished that. I think that the intentions here were not that the listener is stupid. I think that that came out, you know, after. But I don't think that the intentions here justify the actual execution. Will, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. This is really awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. (laughs) Where can the good people of the internet find you? They can find me at podcastproblems.wordpress.com, which is the Podcast Problems Review blog. It also has a newsletter, which you can find on that blog. You can also follow me at Will W underscore writes at Twitter. Awesome. Will, thank you once again. That was wonderful. Where do you stand, listener? Have you been gaslit by a production? How far should someone go to defend kayfabe? Why do you think so many podcasts acknowledge a narrative frame? Tell me your favorite examples and your favorite exceptions. You know where the conversation's happening. We're at Radio Drama on Twitter. And now, it's time for some credits. Our theme music is Danger Did You Do by DJ Stranger Danger. You can find his music on SoundCloud. Longtime listeners of our show will know that the credit sequence is a place where I describe our crew in, shall we say, heightened language. I have this to say for myself. What I will acknowledge is that I believe these descriptions approach a kind of emotional truth. In 1998, our line producer, Matthew Boudreau, was apprehended by U.S. Marshals while attempting to transport 3,000 pounds of gold ingots, which he claimed he had mined and smelted himself. The gold was seized, Matt was released, and those alleged U.S. Marshals were never seen again. Until now. 
In March of 2017, our interview's producer, Eli McElveen, was going on a pleasant spring walk with his husband through the OLG Casino in Brantford, Ontario, when he saw two familiar faces at the craps table, peeking out from giant Stetson hats, their heads wreathed in cigar smoke. That's funny, Eli said. Public smoking's not legal in Ontario, even in a casino. And then he recognized the men, because Matt had posted their images behind the register here at Radio Drama Revival headquarters. Eli snapped a photo and immediately called Heather Cohen and Monique Boudreau, our researchers who leapt into action. The combination of photographs, hat size, and cigar brand revealed everything they needed to know. Heather dug up a string of alter egos, Jasper Strange Minute, Dinty Less, Hannibal Preckwinkle, Lester Bunting. All of them connected back to those two marshals that broke bad back in 1998. With what Heather discovered, Monique was able to reconstruct their trail of crimes all the way back to 1983. And then they called Fred. Fred, our executive producer, the implacable hound, the unstoppable detective. No sooner had he received the message than he kissed his wife and kids goodbye, packed up his galoshes and his lucky goat, and raced out the door. It was at an airport in Honduras where he caught up with them. Hannibal Preckwinkle and Lester Bunting, or so they were calling themselves. Bunting was taxiing a twin-engine Cessna towards the runway of Toncontin Airport in Tegucigalpa, and as he did, Fred saw through his spyglass a glint of gold in the cargo area. 3,000 pounds of gold, just under the maximum takeoff weight of the Cessna 425. Fred blasted over the fence and onto the runway with his motorcycle, spouting flames from his engine as he did, making it to the airplane just in time to grab hold of Hannibal Preckwinkle's leg as he boarded the plane. Bunting began to accelerate. Fred held on to Preckwinkle's leg for dear life. Preckwinkle reached for his pistol, and Fred pulled on that leg. He pulled and pulled and pulled on Preckwinkle's leg, just like I've been pulling yours. <laughs> I lied. I'm your host, David Reinstrom, and this has been Radio Drama Revival. All storytellers welcome. Oh, wait, I forgot to say uh, uh, that we're going deep. Will, thank you so much for going deep with me on this topic. <clears throat> Where can the good people on the... What? Don't snicker. I'm sorry. Make you sound weird. <laughs> fine. Uh, I don't even care. I'm sorry. I'm six. Uh, 